So sometimes we create negative image of the villagers that these people are opposing the animal rescue. They are against animals, against sanctuary, against wildlife. That is not the situation. If we see the ground reality, these people are very helpful. Working with animal itself is most exciting and challenging thing because every day is a different thing, different challenge. You have to continuously improvising your way of working because animal quickly learn your ways of working and they come out with the ways to overpower you. Always keep improvising your own style to keep the animal under control. Because if we see, zoo is a relatively new industry uh, because it was a very old profession. Like we are petting the animals for last 10-15 thousand years. The oldest pet animal is the dog. The domestic dog is supposed to be living with humans and the second oldest would be horses. All the other pet animals have come after that. So we have a very good bonding with dogs. They have adapted to our lifestyle they have completely become pet. But zoo is not about petting the animals. It's about their conservation. If we talk about India's goals for zoo management, we have three objectives. The very first objective is to contribute ex situ conservation efforts. So there are two ways of conservation. One is in situ, wherein we have national parks, sanctuaries, protected areas, where we protect animals, wildlife, all the flora fauna in their natural habitat but in certain cases their population is so less or they have certain dangers in their natural habitat wherein only in situ situations are not enough or in situ conservation may not be helpful for its long term conservation so in that case we take certain specimens of those animals into captivity we maintain them in captive habitat we make them breed, we increase their captive population and we try to relocate them in their natural habitat so that we have multiple populations available for the conservation of that uh, endangered animal. But that is just one aspect. Similarly, the other objective is, as you mentioned earlier, we need to create awareness among the masses. So not everyone can afford to go in the forest and see the tiger or wildlife they have need to have some opportunities within their vicinity. So in that case, zoo becomes very handy. People can visit within their cities and experience the live animals. They can see the live animals. They can observe the behaviors. They can experience how they live, how they walk, or what is a wild animal. So that is the second objective. And third, through various education activities, we can sensitize these masses what they need to do about the wildlife conservation, what is their contribution to which they can contribute conservation of specific animal habitat or a particular species. Okay, so this is the basic. So in India, our zoos are relatively old. Zoos are continuously evolving. So there are three generations of zoos so far. The very first zoo was menageries. Even before menageries are Indian rulers had private collection of animals like Akbar, Jahangir, they used to have huge collection of deers, antelopes, cheetahs, leopards. Uh, there are very few records of having tiger and lions also in the captivity. So they used to collect the cubs and rear them in the captivity. So even in movies you have seen the kings are walking with the tigers and lions. So that was kind of zoo experience but it was restricted only for the royal families. So in the late 17th century or early 18th century, the Britishers came and during the same era, some of the Indian Nawabs opened their private animal menageries for public viewing. So they used to keep these animals into very small enclosures. They were like gel uh, enclosures, the vertical bar enclosures. And there was no natural naturalistic feeling or the animal was completely jailed kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So this was the original concept of the zoo in India. 
but eventually when britishers entered they decided to take it to a larger extent because in europe they were trying it they are they were collecting animals from all over the world and exhibiting them in the european zoos london zoo was very famous in those days on the similar similar lines they established zoos in kolkata delhi and few other cities uh, in early 19th century queen victoria was visiting india so for her personal pleasure they built two zoos in uh, in maharashtra one was in mumbai which is right now uh, veer mata jizabata zoo so that is one of the oldest zoo established by the britishers for the private entertainment of queen victoria that's why it was called rani ka bag okay so later on it, the name was changed a similar zoo was built in nagpur also because queen victoria was supposed to visit nagpur so her old bungalow the surrounding garden was converted into a animal collection later on they were open to the zoo. but these zoos were a uh, representation of victorian era Correct. so these older zoos are called menageries or victorian zoos so these victorian zoos are very typical uh, construction they are like a uh, house with the front uh, exhibition with the barred grills so that is a typical jail like situation where animal has very little space to move around it it was old concept of zoo exhibit so slowly britishers realized that this way of animal exhibiting is not very helpful animals are very much into pain they are not showing their natural behavior but originally it was not about animals comfort it was only about exhibiting animals to the people and creating sensitization because conservation was not the word coined so far we are talking about early 19th century yeah. so eventually these zoo started to develop in 1930s they came up with naturalistic zoo concept so in london in germany they constructed moated enclosures they were relatively huge in size where animal had plenty of space they planted natural trees into them they created some artificial structures so that animal can climb on that animal can rest in the water a similar exhibit was created in kolkata zoo also so we got at the same time as somewhere around 1930s so that was the beginning of indian zoo where we started to develop but after independence government of india's priorities were different and zoo was part of entertainment industry and it was not in the priority so many private zoo keepers came up with their private zoos they had there was no scientific training institution available in india or anywhere in the world so people who were used to see the victorian zoos they built their own zoos in the victorian style most of the zoo keepers were private owners so they had limited resources small spaces so in available budget and uh, in available land they created this victorian style zoos and we had plenty of zoos till 1970s government of india realized the situation that the way of exhibiting animals in such small zoos in such pathetic condition is not going to be useful in long term so they decided to formulate a policy it's called national zoo policy it was drafted in 1970 and accepted in the same year this to remember this was before we got our Na- national wildlife protection act okay so zoo policy came before the wildlife protection act okay and we had these animals in the zoos right before our wildlife protection act so today we are not catching animals from the forest many people have this conception mm-hmm. that zoo people are going in the forest and collecting the animals and keeping in the zoo Correct. so we should know that these animals are in the zoo much before we got the wildlife protection act and we are not catching new animals from the forest okay so 1972 we got the wildlife protection act but uh, we had this zoo policy only in the form of policy we did not got the guidelines or a legal format to this policy this took around 20 25 years after the wildlife protection act and in 1990 we got the resolution for central zoo authority and in 1992 central zoo authority was established to regulate all the zoo related activities within the country mm. so in the same year 
TZA drafted various guidelines for regulations of the zoo related activities and they uh, released certain rules and regulations so all the zoos right now working in the country are abided by these rules and regulations okay so when the CZA was established we had almost 600 plus zoos and circuses in the country and they were working in the Victorian style there were the zoos were not good in shape and size so their ticket was very less fund availability was a constraint so the zoos were really not developing even there was no support from the government there were very few zoos run by the government and even government was lacking the proper guidelines or the directives to operate a zoo so our zoos were relatively poor until 1992 so when the CZA came into existence with their rules and new guidelines they started imposing various restrictions to the zoo they created a directory for all these zoos and they started giving them stipulations what they need to do in certain time frame to continue as a operating zoo so by the year 2002 we had around 250 zoos and today in 2020 we have only 150 zoo running at the moment and almost 95 percent of those zoos are run by the government so now we have limited number of zoos so government can focus on these limited number of zoos and spend money give them some grants and upgrade their basic infrastructure their facilities to world-class uh, levels so this is about basic situation so those people who are complaining about why the zoos in india are very poor this is the background because we cannot afford to have so much expenditure on entertainment industry because zoo was historically seen as only entertainment industry and after 2000 they are focusing on the conservation aspects of the zoo so now we have uh, conservation breeding programs running in various zoos so asa have uh, certain zoos who are breeding pygmy hawks in uh, Punjab border we have Pinjo which is a pure breeding center breeding only vultures there are various other zoos who are doing various conservation programs we have king cobra breeding program we have pangolin breeding programs we have uh, lion tiger most of the animals are now bred in the captivity and we have a good gene pool of these captive animals so about the evolution of the zoo now we had the victorian zoos we were which were like the jail conditions mm -hmm. then we got the naturalistic zoo mm -hmm. where we have relatively larger space and we are doing some artificial plantation artificial structure to give animal naturalistic feet most of the indian zoos at the second level of evolution and now recently we are entering into third stage of evolution which are immersing zoos so nature immersing zoos is a relatively new concept for India. I believe only four or five zoos are upgrading their infrastructure to this third stage of evolution. So Chennai Zoo is upgrading, uh, uh, this Vishakapatnam is upgrading, Mumbai Zoo has recently upgraded their facility. It is still under progress. And all the new facilities that are coming in the next five years will be of this third, third stage of evolution, that is nature immersing zoos. So when we select a natural landscape, we, uh, without disturbing that natural landscape, we embed our enclosure in such a way that the visitors and the animals do not feel that it is a captive uh, situation. Okay, so this is the third stage of zoo. And you will see a lot of zoos developing infrastructure to this stage in coming few years. The types of zoo. We need to also understand what are the types of zoo. In India, CZA has categorized zoos into three categories. Small zoo, medium zoo, large zoo. Depending on their area size, number of visitors, number of animals in their collection. But, but that is just the administrative classification. In operational style, we have three types of, three or four types of zoos. First category is the zoo. It's open for public viewing, public exhibits where people can visit, see the animals. So that is in general called zoos. Second category is called rescue centers. So rescue centers are usually not open to public for viewing animals. We have many conflict situations where animals enter in the human habitation or sometimes 
strayed animals uh, attack nearby human habitations and they cause conflict so these animals are caught by the forest department or the designated authorities sometimes we have injured animals like if the road is passing through a forest and animals get hit by the car or passing vehicles these animals or any other situation where animal is injured or not able to recover itself because of anthropogenic act if a tiger is trying to attack a deer it's not the anthropogenic it's a natural cycle so we will not rescue a deer but if the deer is hit by the car it is because of human intervention so we need to take that animal bring it to into rescue center we treat that animal and once it's recovered we release it back into the forest so and third category we have is breeding center so we have critically endangered animals. we select a few individuals of them we bring them into captivity we breed them we try to maintain all their natural behaviors if they don't have that we try to give them those natural behaviors natural instincts and they are again released back into the wild to reestablish their natural population so that is third category awesome. uh, yes we are we are working on that yeah. uh, right now uh, i am developing this gorewada international zoo so this will be first zoo with international standards so here we are incorporating all the latest technology into communicating visitors yeah. so we, you will have audio visual experiences you have touch screen kiosk for visitor interpretation in fact many zoos have already started using this technology if you go to mumbai zoo chennai zoo chennai zoo has started their virtual tour so you can just log into their website and you can visit their zoo sitting at your home you can access various information about the animals from one click so people are using technologies uh, what we used to feel until now until just 3 years or 4 years ago was the basic limitation of our infrastructure the internet speed was not proper or uh, sometimes even the connectivity many zoos are away from the city or in the outskirts of the city where internet connection broadband facilities was the limitation many zoos have already started adopting these newer technologies mm-hmm. and uh, we uh, yeah the costs have come down drastically many new zoos are adopting these technologies yesterday i was reading about some zoo which has uh, used qr code uh, based signages so you have to just uh, scan the qr code given at the animal enclosure and you hear the information about the animal you can play the different sound videos read different information so this is new info uh, technology being used in the indian zoos so you can actually hear sometimes animal is just resting because we don't understand usually the animal also has its own leisure time mm-hmm. usually people visit in the zoos during afternoon time when the animals are resting okay. and they feel uh, animal is lethargic it is not properly managed mm-hmm. uh, it's the personal uh, individual uh, Uh, what you can say perception about them mm-hmm. but zoo people do not force animal to do tricks it's not circus it is zoo correct where animals are animals have freedom to express their own natural behavior and usually after when they rest there have been few efforts in that mm-hmm. uh, see these technologies are still very expensive correct they it cannot be monitored remotely you have to uh, monitor it manually so it is still expensive and out of, sometimes out of reach to the department or the local resources mm-hmm. we are talking about the remote forest locations where Correct. you may not have trained personnel available very easily so yes wherever possible we do uh, chip the animals microchipping of animals is also done to record their movement if the animal again comes back into human habitation there have been few uh, cases where these animals were radio collared to monitor their movement their behavior mm-hmm. so those ex- uh, experiments were de- uh, done before but still i would say these are at the experimental level uh, we do not have em- uh, enough financial and technological support to do it with each and every animal but yes we are doing doing it every in fact every rescue is a very special thing 
because mm-hmm. you you do all the efforts possible to save that one particular individual mm-hmm. so i remember several instances uh when i was working in pune i got a call to rescue a goat this goat had fallen into a well and when we reached there from the nearest road head the well was at least 3 km inside in a farmland and just next to the farmland there was forest and probably in the night time this herd of boar ke enter try to enter in the farm but since the well was at the ground level the female goat fell into the well when we reached there we had no source no clue how to take it out because the animal must be weighing at least 600 kg and well was more than 30 ft deep so fortunately animal was not injured uh but local villagers supported us very nicely the farm owner allowed us to bring jcb and all the bulldozers all the heavy vehicles through his farm destroying his uh, produce just to save that one life that was very helpful of those from that farmer so sometimes we create negative image of the villagers that these people are opposing the animal rescue they are against animals against sanctuary against wildlife that is not the situation if we see the ground reality these people are very helpful mm. i have seen many instances where uh, one of the family member was taken by the leopard or tiger but still these people don't want to just shoot that animal but many of our urban activists start uh, their agitation that shoot that animal catch that animal but these villagers these tribes they have accepted these animals into their life i believe that is the lesson everyone should agree that we must accept these animals as part of our life we as a visitor when we visit a national park or sanctuary we just enjoy seeing that animal but we often forget that animal often cause nuisance to the people living in that area It often lifts their cattle sometimes deer just enter into their farms and they destroy all the crops but those people never complain about it they have accepted it in fact if you in mp they every forest village has a temple of uh, waghasur they worship the tiger so that's a they have created deity out of it so it is give respect take respect and if that animal causes some uh, damage to you they simply ignore and uh, they just respect the animal but uh, we urban people have got disconnect from the nature from these animals Absolutely. we cannot even tolerate one gecko or one squirrel uh, in our house i have seen people who are call us to just rescue that lizard or snake in their garden if the snake is non venomous we should let it live there why to uh, relocate it if it is venomous yes we understand the risk we may uh, try to relocate it but each and every wildlife in and around your house why it should be relocated right. we need to learn the acceptance and coexistence is what i feel everyone should understand wildlife is already we are just ignoring it correct so to understand it in simple words when you spot a snake near your house or in your garden it's not that You, uh, the snake has entered yesterday and you see it today Correct. the snake was living there for hundreds of years even before you constructed your own house because okay. snake don't understand the boundaries they don't understand the land ownership laws they are living there for hundreds of years Correct. right you have encroached their land they were already there hmm. they have accepted it they are not calling any rescue center that somebody has encroached our land please remove this human family Mm, Unfortunately, don't, they don't have that facility, but they have learned to live with us. We also need to find out ways of living with them. Mm. As I just said, we need to take inspiration from these tribals, these remote village people who still accept nature as their neighbors. So that is the only key. Coexistence is the key of survival. Right. But yes. <laughs> but yes if you people are interested in doing something i recommend all the viewers whoever is interested in contributing his own bit just contact your nearest zoo or forest department ask them if they need any volunteers because okay. in forestry activity you need lot of volunteers 
sometimes to just clean the forest sometimes to control the fire mm-hmm. in zoos we need lot of volunteers to mm-hmm. regulate the crowd sometimes with uh, in treatment of animals sometimes in hey, there can be various activities where you can be part you know? so that is one aspect if you don't have the spare time to go and volunteer uh, volunteer for some other organization but but just start sitting home you can also contribute to uh, save electricity save water save paper everything ultimately leads to conservation of forest and wild so a sustainable lifestyle is equally important rather than active participation in the conservation so i think each and every one of us can contribute to the conservation by this way government has limited resources government is trying its best mm-hmm. in all the available resources. but government is representation of us we have few people among us working mm-hmm. for the government Correct. so there are limited hands if we join our hands together we can bring that change much earlier so yes. as gandhi ji said be the change that you want to see